السلام عليكم فايبر اوبتيك اندوسكوبيك ايفالويشن اوف ذا سوالوينج فيز از ا ستاندردايزد اند افاليديتد تكنيك ذات توجذر ويز فيديو فلوروسكوبي اوف ذا فارينكس اند ابر اسوفاجوس كونستيتوتس ذا كورنر ستون ان ذا دايجنوزيس بلانينج اوف ذا مانجمنت اند فولو اب اوف كيسز اوف فانكشنال ديسفاجيا particularly pharyngeal and upper esophageal dysphagia. The standard fees procedure is a 12 steps standard technique that can take anything between 20 and 40 minutes by the end of the procedure. The uh, observer should be in a position to identify what is the cause of the dysphagia and plan a management and try to implement it. It starts by scanning the larynx and the pharynx for any structural abnormalities. And if this can be biopsied, this can be done during the same procedure. You should also be in a position to see if there is any uh, retained secretions or saliva in the pharynx and uh, assess if there is any delay in the triggering of the swallow reflex. And after introducing some colored food and drinks, the observer should be able to see if there is any residue left in the pharynx after the swallow and where is this residue and if there is any penetration to the larynx or aspiration into the trachea and at the end he should be in a position to try different food and drink consistencies and volumes and rate of administration together with different head positions and different um, maneuvers to aid in the swallowing. At first, do no harm. The very beginning of the procedure is a risk assessment of aspiration before introducing any colored food or drink. If there is any pooling of secretions or saliva in the hypopharynx, particularly if this is combined with either a reduced frequency of the swallowing or a reduced or absent pharyngeal squeeze, contraction of the pharyngeal muscles, or a reduced sensation in the aryepiglottic fold or the larynx, then these factors are highly predictive of aspiration. The important thing at this stage is to check the laryngeal competency in terms of adduction and elevation before the introduction of any colored food or drink. The food and drink used in the procedure should preferably be light in color to reflect the light of the endoscope and be easily identifiable in penetration of the larynx or aspiration into the trachea or in the folds of the bifon fossa or the postcricoid area. Now, white is perfect, green is all right, but you should avoid colors like uh, brown or red. Water, milk, milk shakes and puddings, canned peaches, crackers or biscuits are, can all be used. There is good evidence that milk and milkshakes can be identified uh, easily during the procedure. And if you want to avoid the use of any coloring dye, this can be used. The swallowing of different material, uh, fluids, thin fluids, thick fluids, and semi-solids and, and solids uh, should be tried in an ascending order, starting with the thin fluids first. If there is any problem at any point, you can start uh, changing the consistency of the fluid, the volume of per bolus, and the rate of the introduction, together with other uh, factors like the head position, and the posture, of the body and things like that to test the ability of the patient to tolerate uh, some types of food. The procedure is started with small boluses of volumes of about three to five milliliters of thin fluid. And if this can be tolerated well, this can be increased in the volume and in the rate of the introduction. If there are any pro problems, uh, thickeners can be added so that you can change a thin fluid to a thick fluid uh, or a thick fluid to uh, semi-soft to see if this can be handled better by the patient. If there is aspiration at any stage during this ascending order, the 
whole process should not be stopped altogether because this would uh, mean that the patient would lose the chance to identify what type of food and drink he can handle. If there is aspiration with um, a thin fluid, for example, it can be thickened. If there is aspiration with a large volume, it can be reduced. If there is aspiration with a frequent introduction of boluses, this can be slowed down. And the important thing is to try things in an ascending order, um, starting with the very small and the very thin and going up the ladder gradually. And if there are problems, then modifications can be introduced in terms of volume, consistency, rate of introduction, and also uh, some head positions and certain um, instructions to the patient. And these are the 12 steps of the standard fees procedure, starting with checking the velopharyngeal competency when the scope is held uh, above the level of the soft palate, followed by introduction of the scope a little bit further to check the hypopharynx at rest and notice if there is any secretions or saliva pulled in there, followed by pharyngeal squeeze and testing of the sensation of the pharynx and the larynx, and then checking of the laryngeal competency by again maneuvering the tip of the scope a little bit to see if there is adequate uh, adduction and abduction and laryngeal elevation, testing the cough reflex, and then if there, there are reasons to suspect uh, a high risk of aspiration, you start the introduction with ice chips rather than colored food and drink. If this can be tolerated, you go up the ladder to the colored food and drink, and then assessment of any aspiration or pooled um, retained secretions in the pharynx, followed by the uh, examination of the upper esophageal sphincter area. And by the end, if you have identified the cause of the problem, you can start trying different therapeutic adjustment in terms of uh, bolus volume, texture, consistency, rate of introduction, head positions, or efforts from the patient to swallow better. Different areas of the upper aerodigestive tract will be examined during the FIS procedure, and the tip of the endoscope will be adjusted accordingly to check for the competency of the velopharyngeal uh, sphincter the tip of the scope should be held above the level of the soft palate, as we'll see in a second, um, followed by scanning of the hypopharynx in general at rest for any pooling of secretions and testing the sensation and pharyngeal squeezes. Um, here, the tip of the scope will be held above the level of the epiglottis, and then checking the larynx, laryngeal competency, and after introduction of the food and drinks, you would always want to keep the tip of the scope above the level of the epiglottis so that you can see what is happening with the base of the tongue and the pellicula and the contractions of the pharynx and the movements of the larynx. And finally, the area of the upper esophageal sphincter and the postcricoid area. So the tip of the scope would move between different positions in the nasopharynx for pharyngoscopy, laryngoscopy, scanning of the pharynx and the upper airway and the lower part of the pharynx. We start by checking the competency of the nasopharyngeal sphincter. No local anesthesia is used uh, so as not to affect the sensation of the larynx and the pharynx. The tip of the scope is introduced into the nasopharynx, but kept above the level of the soft palate, so as to uh, check the mobility of the soft palate and the competency of the nasopharyngeal sphincter during phonation. Next, the tip of the scope is introduced a little bit further, but kept above the level of the base of the tongue, so as to visualize the base of the tongue, the vellicula, the whole of the larynx, and the whole of the pharynx during rest, at rest initially. Uh, we scan for any abnormalities or any lesions in the hypopharynx of the larynx, 
see if there is any protruding osteophytes, if there is any signs of laryngopharyngeal reflux, which may alter, for example, the laryngeal adducting reflex, and see the baseline of the rate of the swallowing. This should be about three uh, swallows per minute while the scope is inside the hypopharynx. Next is the pharyngeal squeeze maneuver. The patient is asked to produce a long and high-pitched E and will watch for any lateral pharyngeal contraction. If this is present, like we've just seen, this uh, correlates uh, with the pharyngeal contractility strength. It's good news to have the, a positive uh, pharyngeal squeeze maneuver. It means that this patient can handle puree fruit even if there is reduced or even absent laryngopharyngeal sensation. The next thing is to check for any retained secretions or saliva in the hypopharynx before introducing any colored food or drink. If there is any saliva retained or in the hypopharynx, you would want to check if this is being aspirated during swallowing. You can make things easier by placing just two drops of a colored fluid to the base of the tongue and ask the patient to swallow it. Then it would be easier to trace the colored saliva. If there is any pooling of saliva in the glottic area in here or any penetration or aspiration, then the next thing would be to check if this patient can handle ice chips before introducing any food or drinks. The next thing is to test for the sensation of the larynx and the pharynx. And one validated way of doing this is the FEAST uh, procedure for flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing with sensory testing, in which air puffs at a rate of about 50 milliseconds are introduced through a special port in the scope itself and directed towards the aryepiglottic fold. The pressure of the pups are calibrated, and so long as the pressure is less than four millimeters of mercury, can produce adduction of the vocal cord if the air puffs are directed toward the uh, aryepiglottic fold, then we know that the superior laryngeal nerve is working well. If more pressure is required, or if there is no response at all, then we know that there is either a defective or absent laryngeal adductor reflex. This reflex is reduced or even abolished altogether in patients who have gastroesophageal reflux. It's interesting to see that even by introducing some acid on uh, and instilling some acid on the aryepiglottic fold, the reflex would be reduced. If the special port for the introduction of the air puffs is not available, one can use the tip of the nasopharyngoscope to test for the sensation of the larynx and the pharynx. This is particularly important in the presence of retained secretions or saliva in the hypopharynx at rest. And the uh, tip of the scope can be used to touch uh, some laryngeal or pharyngeal structures and watch for the laryngeal adduction reflex and note if there is any absent reflex if one of these areas is being touched the uh, pharyngeal wall the base of the tongue the aryepiglottic fold the ventricular folds or the true vocal folds by integrating the information gained so far from testing for the laryngeal adductor reflex which uh, reflects the integrity of the superior laryngeal nerve and the pharyngeal squeeze maneuver which is a rough guide to the contractility of the pharyngeal muscles some important decisions can be taken even before starting the patient on any colored food and drink if both are lost the uh, laryngeal adductor reflex and the pharyngeal squeeze then there is a very high risk of aspiration up to 100% if the patient is started on thin liquids and just less than that on thickened liquids or purees.
But if there is a positive pharyngeal squeeze, even in the absence of laryngeal adductor reflex, then the chance of aspiration is very low with purees and about 15% with thin liquids. The next two steps, number six and number seven, would require repositioning of the tip of the scope so as to focus on the larynx rather than the pharynx. You still need to have the tip of the epiglottis in view together with other laryngeal structures. Here we'll be assessing the larynx for any structural abnormalities like paralysis of the vocal folds or any other lesions. We'll be testing the position of the vocal cords at rest or during breathing, uh, the full abduction during sniffing, full abduction during phonation, swallowing, a good cough, a good dry cough, and we'll be testing the limits of the laryngeal mobility and integrity by asking the patient to hold the breath to the count of seven or count from one to ten and asking him to produce an E with a very high pitch and an E with a very loud voice. In the high risk patients who have retained secretions or saliva in the pharynx, and before starting them on any colored food or drink, we want to assess the risk of aspiration. And this will be achieved by repositioning the tip of the scope from the uh, pharyngeal uh, general view to a view of the inside of the larynx, particularly the glottic and the subglottic area. The patient will be asked to swallow his saliva, and if there is any a leak of saliva to the glottic area or to the subglottic area, then the patient will need to be tested with uh, ice chips. The initial testing of the patients with ice chips before starting them on any colored food or drink would be required if the patient had not had any oral intake for a long period of time, or if the patient have retained secretions and pooling of saliva in the hypopharynx or the laryngeal vestibule. It's a fairly safe method. It maximizes the sensory input due to the coldness of the eyes and also minimizes the risk of irritation or infection if it gets aspirated. If the patient can handle the swallowing of ice chips well, then he can be then um, tested with colored food and drink. If he cannot handle this and aspirated the ice chips, then whether there is any cough attempts to clear the, th the trachea and the larynx from the aspirated eyes should be noted. This would help in differentiating between uh, aspiration with or without a cough reflex uh, that is uh, stage 7 or 8 from the uh, pass scale. The next thing would be to start testing the patient with colored food and fluids. And if the patient can handle a small bolus, this can be uh, increased in volume and the rate of administration of the boluses can also be increased. And um, we will be tracing the colored food or drink to assess if there is any residual food and drink in the pharynx after the swallow and either in the pharynx or in the vellicula to see if there is any delay in the triggering of the swallowing reflex or to see if there is any penetration or aspiration of the boluses. The location of any pharyngeal residue after the swallow would help in the diagnosis. If food is retained in the vellicula, like here for example, this may point to weakness of tongue base contraction, weakness of pharyngeal contraction, or weakness of the hyolaryngeal elevation. Whereas if there is accumulation of the colored food or drink in the lower part of the pharynx, like in the piriform fossae, for example, like in here, this may point to a problem in the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter like, for example, cricopharyngeal dysmotility or weakness of the contraction of the pharyngeal muscles. Whiteouts occur often during the endoscopic examination, 
when the moving base of the tongue and the contracting pharyngeal wall comes in contact with the tip of the nasopharyngoscope. The presence of a white out does not necessarily indicate that the pharyngeal contractions are normal, but it tells you that it is not absent. The timing of any aspiration or laryngeal penetration in relation to the white out is also of clinical value. This is how we classify aspiration into pre-swallow or aspiration during the swallow or post the swallow. And also any residual food or drink in the pharynx or in the vallecula after the white out should be noted. Step number 10 is to notice any laryngeal penetration or any aspiration of the colored bolus into the airway. This could happen due to a variety of reasons, including incomplete glottic closure, impaired laryngeal sensation, reduced movement of the larynx, particularly elevation during swallowing due to any defects in the hyolaryngeal elevation, any abnormalities of the hyoid bone elevation um, during the swallowing. It can also happen if there is a reduced duration of uh, laryngeal and glottic closure during swallowing in relation to uh, a delayed swallow or a presence of pharyngeal residue or prolonged pharyngeal transient time. If there is enough residue in the hypopharynx when the uh, glottis resumes opening, there is always a, the chance of a spillover into the airway. If there is any spillover of the colored food into the airway is noted, at the depth of the aspiration may be uh, graded using the penetration aspiration scale used in the grading of the depth of aspiration in video fluoroscopy. It's an eight point scale starting with one when there is no aspiration at all to number eight when there is silent aspiration the colored food goes all the way below the vocal cords into the trachea and if it's not ejected there is no cough reflex so it passes through two and three and in number two and three the colored food goes into the laryngeal supraglottic path laryngeal vestibule but remains above the level of the vocal folds. It's completely ejected in, in uh, grade two. Uh, this can be passed as normal, and it's not ejected in three. In grade four or five, the uh, colored food goes in contact with the vocal folds, again ejected in four and not ejected in five. In number six and seven, the colored food goes beyond the vocal folds, um, in number six, it is ejected, and in number seven, it is not. This uh, scale of eight points is important in understanding the severity and the depth of the aspiration. The other important factor in the management of aspiration would be the timing of the penetration or aspiration in relation to the pharyngeal swallow. The white outs, uh, whether it is before, during, or after a pharyngeal swallowing. It has diagnostic and therapeutic implications. The penetration before the swallow is usually uh, due to mishandling of the bolus either in the oral cavity or delayed swallowing uh, initiation. Aspiration during the swallow noted immediately after the white house is usually due to a poorly timed vocal fold adduction or impaired closure of the vocal folds and uh, any defect in the laryngeal airway protective mechanisms including sensory impairment aspiration after the swallow is usually due to a combination of a pharyngeal residue and laryngeal sensory deficit Step number 11 is endoscopic examination of the lower part of the hypopharynx, the cricopharyngeus area, and the upper oesophageal segment. 
it's often not very difficult to pass the tip of the scope through the cracopharyngeus uh, segment in here into the upper part of the esophagus. And this would give some valuable information about the cricopharyngeus muscle, whether there is any strictures or spasms in there, or any abnormalities in the upper part of the esophagus as well. And finally, we reach step number 12. By this stage, hopefully, a clear idea about what went wrong has been formed, and it's now time to try therapeutic uh, maneuvers and different strategies for rehabilitation of the defective uh, swallowing. One way of helping the patients would be adjusting the uh, um, swallowing strategies, advising patients on different ways of improving the swallowing technique. This will be covered in presentations to follow. For example, if there is a problem of pooling of uh, bolus into one of the pyriform fossae. Uh, this can be helped by turning the head of the patient during swallowing to the other side. This would obliterate the uh, pyriform fossae on the other side here and prevent the accumulation of the uh, bolus in there and the potential spill over into the larynx. There are other uh, swallowing strategies and swallowing advice that can be given to the patient and tried in the last step of the uh, flexible endoscopic examination of uh, swallowing. Things like trying to start the meals with uh, ice chips or uh, ice cold beverages to give the maximum sensory input or trying of variations in the consistency of the food of the beverages uh, to prevent aspiration, starting with a very small size of the bolus and going up uh, gradually, uh, repeating the uh, thing with soft uh, solids or with thin liquids or thick uh, liquids as well. Um, various things can be tried at the last step of the fees examination to see if this is going to help with the swallowing and also prevent aspiration. Video endoscopy and video fluoroscopy complement rather than compete with each other. There will be patients in whom a video endoscopy can bring about more information and others in whom video fluoroscopy would be better. Video endoscopy is a fairly safe procedure. The rate of the epistaxis is about 7 in 10 thousands. The incidence of airway compromise during the fees examination is next to zero. The two uh, techniques, the endoscopy and the fluoroscopy, give the same diagnosis and the same uh, staging in more than three quarters of patients who have pharyngeal uh, propulsion dysphagia and more than 80% of patients who have aspiration. They would reach the same conclusion. As a very high level of agreement. But when they differ, it is the video endoscopy that would tend to overstage the uh, degree of dysphagia or the degree of aspiration. There is a tendency for the video endoscopy to have higher scores in the penetration aspiration scale uh, compared to the video fluoroscopy, and the same applies to the bolus residue uh, scale for uh, quantification of the pharyngeal residue. The fees is more often utilized in long-term facilities uh, like care homes because it can be performed at bedside and of course the video fluoroscopy has to be carried out in a hospital setting and there is uh, some also radiation exposure during the uh, video fluoroscopy examination. Um, there is also some I uh, would argue that fees is more invasive due to the use of the endoscope. Video endoscopy has limitations, including diagnosis of defects in the oral phase, which can only be diagnosed by video fluoroscopy, for example. The same applies to problems in the upper esophageal segment. It's much better clarified by video fluoroscopy than video endoscopy.
and the same for esophageal abnormalities up to the lower end of the esophagus. There is also the problem of the whiteouts, this brief period when the image is obliterate, obliterated due to the uh, opposition of the tissues to the tip of the endoscope. By this, we come to the end on this presentation on the video endoscopy 12 uh, steps technique and the diagnosis of functional dysphagia. Salam alaikum.